There's a whole matter of American culture, which is so fascinating, founded by philosophers Madison, Hamilton, uh, Jefferson, I mean, obviously, and yet a deep aversion to disciplined philosophical thought shared by most people. When I'm working with any set of texts in the United States, I certainly don't feel American. I don't think America as a culture is particularly philosophical. I don't think it's hospitable to philosophers. France is something else. A philosophy book in France is a bestseller. Somebody like Derrida is literally a star. He sells 50,000 copies. The philosophy of the frontier. The real men uh, were the vanguard. <laughs> forge their way, cut their way through wilderness. Uh, and then the women, children, and teachers. Uh, thinkers brought up the rear if they were included at all. I mean, I don't know what this is like maybe in France. I mean, they're probably, you know, if you're, I'm sure there are a lot of practical-minded people in France. It's not like everyone is like a, you know, Gilles Deleuze or whatever, you know? So I'm sure you can, you know, alienate your parents by becoming a philosopher in France, too, probably. I would read my mother's uh, Ebony magazines, and they had an advertisement about Cornel West is keeping faith. America and is And I just now. saw this brother with a huge afro, and, it, and the title really just hooked me, keeping faith, race and philosophy in America. In so, okay, race. I had no idea what this philosophy business was. but I was interested in reading things about race at the time. So I decided to order his book. But from that book, I became interested in studying the history of philosophy, and I came across the dialogues of Plato. And for several years, that's all I knew of philosophy, Cornell West and Plato. And I know that's an odd combination, but that's, that was my introduction to philosophy. Thinking, like that was definitely stressed in my family sitting around and thinking about ideas and arguing about ideas was, but I don't think anyone saw it as a profession. I think that switch was a little hard for some in my family. My father said this when I said I'll be a philosophy major. He said, this is a phase, you'll outgrow this. My mother thought it was a phase that I would grow out of. I think he was more worried about the practicalities of it. My dad wanted me to become a TV repairman. There have been some in my extended family who pursued things in an idealistic way but did not lead to self-support um, and so we're not practical. Because he thought people would always need their TVs fixed. But who the hell needs, you know, the next move in the free will debate, you know what I mean? Uh, nobody. So sitting around and dreaming about ideas, there was a dangerous side to that. Are you just drifting off into dreamland and in mere philosophy? <laughs> Example. I have a cousin who's worked on um, a mechanism to sail icebergs down from the North Atlantic to solve California's water problems. My father himself um, patented a sonic cleanser of some kind that didn't actually take off. Another cousin who was brilliant but had money and kind of hung out and talked to people and drank too much and died early and so there's that side to a life of the mind. And that same cousin did things like play nude golf and you know a little eccentric <clears throat> and there are members of the family that are eccentric. <laughs> My parents did not bat an eye when I came home and said I was going to major in philosophy and go to graduate school at the age of 18. They thought that was great. My father was like, no, there's no way. Philosophy, that's not even a real job. What do you do? I didn't have chores. I read all the time. I grew up in um, Chappaqua, New York, and Princeton, New Jersey, which were two extremely affluent areas. Um, I was spoiled. He's going, that's not a job. Because he grew up all his life in manual labor. Um, pretty much hard, back-breaking work at lump. And he didn't recognize what I was doing at work. So I had what Aristotle uh, said you might need or want for philosophy, which was lots of leisure. So I don't know if this is white male bourgeois privilege. I was born in New York City in 1931. My parents were left-wing journalists associated at the time with the Communist Party. I'm not sure when, the, when I got the concept of philosophy itself. Probably pretty early. My father published a couple books of poems, worked in an advertising agency. My mother was a philosophy professor at a time when there were virtually no women teaching philosophy in the United States. My mother 
contributed articles to magazines like Harper's and Commonweal, mainly on race relations. I grew up in a, quite a bookish house. And so I grew up in a household that had books by Whitman and Emerson and James in the library. My parents had copies of Plato and Nietzsche on the shelves. So I had read a little of both of those men before going to college. The other kids had dens, we had a library. I think that my father was puzzled by my decision to specialize in philosophy. He had nothing in particular against it. I think my mother was perhaps more pleased than my father. My mother's father had been a theologian and she admired her father and thought that her son was more or less following in her father's footsteps. I was in a theological seminary. I was contemplating a, a career in the ministry, I thinking I was going to go into the ministry. Uh, I think a lot of people, certainly not all, but I think a lot of people who are interested in philosophy maybe began by being interested in religion. That's certainly the case with me. I took some philosophy courses and decided that uh, that was really what I wanted to do, and then decided, as I say, that the uh, broad and crooked was probably a lot more fun than the straight and narrow. I had questions about matters of religion, for example. My father is a minister. My parents are very conservative, uh, evangelical Christians, and I was brought up in a very conservative way. Religion presses philosophy to stick with the big questions. This is surely one of the more religious civilizations that's ever existed. I mean, people are very, very intense about their religion here. Well, American philosophy in its first sort of formal garb came out of New England, and therefore it came out of this Calvinist background. If we think about the important people in the American philosophical tradition, I'll mention, but won't say much about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards understood that he was engaged in philosophical not just theological dialogue when he was working with uh, the question of free will. The person I start with is Ralph Waldo Emerson. I would start with, with Emerson. He was, I think, fifth in the line of ministers in the Unitarian Church. They were driven by ideas to do things that their parents could never have imagined. He decided that he couldn't be a minister, didn't want to be a minister. Because he doesn't believe a lot of what that tradition tells him he ought to believe. Even Emerson giving up his pulpit. I mean, he was part of the this center, you know, the Unitarian world. He's giving up this great job. He was the minister of the Second Church of Boston. Big deal, you know, but he didn't want to administer communion, but he couldn't do it. He didn't hear that message, so he gives it up. I, I think philosophy and religion are very closely related. I mean, I think essentially they address the same set of questions um, in many ways. A lot of people, of course, turn to religion when they raise these issues, but, but many people turn to philosophy. And, uh, and ask questions that philosophers they hope can answer, and frequently don't. I st was studying philosophy and sort of became intrigued by this sort of, what I at the time thought was this quest to be rational and reasonable that I found very attractive since I had grown up in circumstances that I thought were pretty unreasonable, namely, you know, racial apartheid. I lived through the Second World War in Hungary. Uh, and a lot of people died, and uh, there were some very tough times. I mean, it was actually fighting all around where we were. I was a little boy. You know, white supremacy and, and you know, segregation required a lot of maintenance. Every white child had to be taught the terms and how to help maintain it through the way in which they would conduct themselves in being white. I became acquainted fairly early in life as a result of that with death. and. Um, uh, that raises questions even in a young child's mind as to what this mess is all about. But we were not going to go to the same school, we were not going to go to the same church, we were not going to eat in the same restaurants, we were not going to sit in the same place in the movie theaters, we were not going to be on the same sports teams until at least not before late 1960s. Uh, so I, 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 I was devoted fairly early in life to finding out answers to the big questions. Uh, questions like, um, is there a God, and if so, how does he relate to us? Uh, what is the nature of man? I was attracted by people who seemed to be making reasonable sense out of things, and so I was like, oh, okay, this can be helpful since I'm living with something that I think is pretty unreasonable and, and, and not very good.